this is now the defining pivotal piece of peer reviewed research about the ocean's temperatures that the IPCC can no longer use as saying warming up ocean temperatures are causing more evaporation to cause record snows. Adapt 2030 Mini Ice Age Conversations covers changes in our climate due to a new and intensifying grand solar minimum. In the media, overlooking, downplaying, or burying cold weather changes occurring on our planet. This is in order to keep the global warming agenda steaming full speed ahead. I do this podcast and radio program because we need to begin conversations on how to adapt our food growing strategies long before 2030 as agricultural zones shift, affecting global crop output, but very few mainstream media outlets are talking about the most important issue of our time, cold weather crop losses. Our sun is going through a 400 year cycle, which has effects on our weather patterns as our magnetosphere weakens and the jet streams go out of flow. It's not CO2, it's not you, it's the sun. Are you ready to thrive in the grand solar minimum? Then join me for many Ice Age Conversations. I'm your host, David Dubine. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are on this planet. Exciting show lined up today. We're going to try to weave ancient history, finding an ancestral, you know, that missing link that they said there's always been between the different sapiens, as homo sapiens ourselves, with the further back humanoid types five million years ago. They say they found the missing link. We're going to talk about that. How about these 100-year, 125-year, 135-year cold snow records shattered across Canada and the United States? Going to try to also put together what is the unraveling. This is the last year in earnest that I do believe you're going to hear about global warming, CO2. The latent heat in the oceans, they forgot to calculate that in the IPCC, so the cooling begins now. But there's a lot of damage control going on in the media to try to dissuade you from even considering that the grand solar minimum is real. It'll have any effect on your life. It won't affect your families. Hey, don't even worry about it. Three-tenths of a degree drop. They're trying to reassure you that global warming by 2100 will increase another three or four degrees Celsius. So just go back to work. Keep paying your taxes. Don't ask questions. It's all good. I'm here to try to present some information so you can protect yourself and your families and get ready for this. Because it is going to affect us all as these increasing food prices are going to dip into the greater economy. And we saw what happened in 2008. Yet this is going to be a never ending 20 plus year event. So the damage that was done in 2008, nine, two years was able to recover. This one, we're going down for good, at least during this iteration of what is considered the global economy. Now, how do you protect yourself from that? How do you see out into the future to provide value so people find value in, in the new economy, in the new system that will emerge out of this? You're well taken care of, and you know that you also can take care of your loved ones, your family, your friends, relatives, and anybody around you who's working with you and helping. So anyway, let's get into today's news. There's a lot of unusual, shall we say, headlines abounding at the moment. Now, the media is at a loss to try to explain away all of these events that are occurring in Canada and the United States at the moment. And when I say that, 100-year snowfall and cold records shattered, broken, eclipsed, and then there's also second silver medal ties with the drawdown in power demand. This is what I talked about last year. I said somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere, these two things would happen this year. First, you would have an area of the planet in the Northern Hemisphere that was buried in so much snow that they would need to bring the army out and it would almost paralyze the society, whether it be a city or a, a town somewhere. And we've seen something very similar like this happening in Austria. Also, I had said that in some places, the grids are going to go down, and there'll be thousands and thousands of people without power as the grids go down due to the electrical demand draw. Now, I don't count this as happening yet, but we're getting very close. Thousands of people without power in Canada due to too much draw. The hydro is not able to fulfill demand up there in Quebec, and the government's out asking people to turn down their heat and also please use electricity at off hours because they can't meet the demand at 
close. It's close, borderline, but not yet. Not a full grid down situation where hundreds of thousands of people without power because the grid just literally went down due to demand. Seems that the seasons are extended out. And we're going to see a repeat of last year's delayed planting as well. That'll have affect the futures prices. So not financial advice, but if you do have a broker, you should be talking to them about commodities, specifically grains, ag commodities, and just kind of look back last year and see what pushed on the price, barley, wheat, these types of things. And understanding that these seismic and volcanic events are cyclical and you want to check out upheaval. Why catastrophic earthquakes will soon strike the United States. Leading experts in the geophysical effects of climate change make a strong case for a link between the sun's cycles of behavior with highly destructive earthquakes. The authors explain that when the sun goes into reduced energy phase, a grand solar minimum as we're entering right now, it produces colder weather and the worst earthquakes across the historical timelines. Included are easy-to-understand charts and graphs showing that we face an imminent threat. Find out the status of the threat for California, Alaska, South Carolina, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and many other states and regions across our planet. And if you want to support this broadcast, click the link in the description box below to Upheaval, Why Catastrophic Earthquakes Will Soon Strike the United States, available in both paperback and Kindle versions. 134-year-old snow record broken in New York. Media is at a loss to explain this. This CO2 warming, you know, the narrative had shifted. Well, now it's because the warming is causing more evaporation in the oceans. So the ocean latent heat is hotter, evaporating more to the atmosphere. And this is causing the record snowfalls. At least that's the newest excuse given over the last three or four years as we started to eclipse these century 120, 150-year marks all over the place, literally across the globe and all the continents. So the excuse was given at that time to try to explain away what's happening. But there's an incredible amount of new information right now coming out called the IPCC Fatal Error Neglecting Ocean Thermal Inertia. Geologists now dictating the sun's driving Earth's climate, not CO2. And the bottom of the Pacific Ocean is getting cooler. And the scientists are now saying it's likely due to the new start of the new little ice age. So with all these ocean anomalies going on and their excuse from the IPCC, at least to explain away these increased snowfalls, was basing it on ocean heat. Now that excuse is out the window. They can't use that any longer because all these new peer-reviewed research studies coming out, especially in these last three weeks, saying uh, oceans are cooling, latent heat not there, bottoms cooling, tops cooling. Sorry, Atlantic Ocean's going into its 60-year cool phase. Uh, look for more ice as the cooler water from the Atlantic makes its way under the ice cap there. So again, it's not increasing sea ice because of cooler waters and cooler temperatures. No, nah, it's got to be CO2 feedback loop somehow. Damage control, you're going to see it at the Uber and then... By 2020, the whole, I don't know, what you've been brought up understanding is CO2 warming models will just no longer make sense. And I guess they'll be relegated to the dustbin of history. They'll have to come up with a new excuse. Maybe they'll come clean on truly what's happening. And that's the reason I do this program. The reason I spend my time talking to you is because if you're more prepared for these changes, I'm going to be more prepared too. Because more prepared populace means everybody's more prepared. So when the changes come... It's not a fear factor. We prepared for this. Let's implement our plan now. Let's implement what we've been learning about growing food, solutions for vertical indoor farming, sprouting, outdoor, greenhouses, communities. It's an entirely different ballgame when you understand what's going on. Now the media is going to have to catch up with that. Corporate media, I should say. Ottawa, coldest in 112 years. Quebec, Coldest in 125 years. New York broke 134-year-old snow record. So the flim-flam excuses from the corporate media is everything from, you're going to laugh when you hear this. There was an isolated 
sliver of a pocket of warm air that's not really warm it's about 10 degrees celsius warmer than the average in the arctic so it's like minus 30 degrees fahrenheit air that crept up in there and mixed with the minus 40 and 50 and 80 degrees air and somehow because it caused more ice because of warming global temperatures was able to push weather fronts down over canada that normally wouldn't be pushed over canada so I looked at the map that they drew off. They were using a tropical tidbits anomaly map, temperature anomaly map, which you can find that everybody's using now. If you see all these news articles, you can go back and track back the information on the dates and times where they found these maps, tropicaltidbits.com. But that was the excuse that some uh, the pencil thin intrusion of air that was minus 30 degrees Celsius below zero had an effect on the rest of the Arctic and pushed all the Arctic air out of the way because there was more sea ice caused by CO2 warming. This is where the insanity comes from. These are the excuses you're, they're now giving you in the media as to why all this is happening. Now, you're going to start to hear this person's name in the media more and more. Dr. Roger Higgs, H-I-G-G-S. Now, this is the team lead for the new paper out, IPCC Fatal Error, Ocean Thermal Inertia. I think this is one of the most important stories of 2019 to come out so far across anywhere in any media. This is now the defining, pivotal, peer-reviewed research about the ocean's temperatures that the IPCC can no longer use as saying, warming ocean temperatures are causing more evaporation to cause record snows. This particular set of data, along with the other sets connected to this, you should no longer hear that excuse any longer. It's been found to be incorrect. So as we go through, also progressing along with cosmic rays, Svensmark's cloud mystery, they're starting to find that Svensmark's research, Henrik Svensmark, is a really interesting story about this person. Researcher, sponsored at a university, funded, but when he and his team started to equate galactic cosmic rays and cosmic rays from the sun as increasing cloud cover in their cloud chambers, their funding was pulled because their models had shown that as we go into this grand solar minimum, the eddy grand solar minimum, the amount of cosmic rays is going to increase. Therefore, we're going to have an incredible amount of new cloud cover from 15,000 to 18,500 feet. And this, in turn, would have record floods, record snows, atmospheric compression events, and a lot of these things that you're seeing at the moment in terms of climatic extremes across the planet. The deserts are blooming again. And there's so many religions, myths, and legends that say when the deserts bloom again, we're in this great time of change. You have to realize there was feet and feet and feet of water all across Saudi Arabia in the deserts. And the third cyclone to rip across Oman, and Yemen, and massive amounts of water and both snowfall up around Jordan, Lebanon, that whole area up there, Iraq as well. The Sahel in North Africa blooming again. That's why the Chinese are there and have been for 15 years investing in rail lines out to the 7,500 year prior mega lakes. All their rails terminate at the edge of the old mega lakes. Now see, that, that in itself is a, an interesting thing because what kind of information do they have in the cycles? Well, they were there 15 years ago prior to the greening that's beginning. Like they knew it was going to green again. In my personal opinion, they're there to grow food to supplement what's not going to, but, but what is being lost in Heilongjiang and other grain growing zones of northern China up there with the border of Korea, North Korea. So all these changes were forecast specifically from Svensmark's work talking about increases in Galactic cosmic rays and cloud cover. And we're starting to see the same thing happening now that was predicted. So Svensmark's work is now being verified not only through CERN with their cloud chambers, but it's very apparent now that man-made global warming believers by 2021 will have to admit they were wrong. Well, they'll have to readjust the models of CO2. The IPCC, remember, let's go back to 2013 for a second. Now, this is a co-author, physicist, Dr. Lockwood, 
was originally saying that they couldn't explain that the sun shouldn't have anything to do with global mean surface temperatures over 25 years because they were tracking solar cycles and saying, all right, this solar cycle, we had a real high peak, but okay, temperatures warmed. 1999, I think, was the highest ever in this last 400 years of activity. And then it's dropped off since then. So we've had another solar cycle and a half. And they're saying, look, it didn't track, it didn't cool down when the solar cycles diminished in intensity. And that was the whole premise of the IPCC of saying, look, the solar cycles are decreasing in intensity. There's less sunspots, less activity. For the second solar cycle in a row after the the heat spike in 1999 and 98. But temperatures haven't dropped as much as following on the sunspot cycles. And that's the whole reason that the IPCC says the sun doesn't have any impetus into our climate system here. And you have to realize, now how much CO2 is up there driving this whole CO2 narrative? Now you could come down and talk about percentages like three one hundredths of one percent. And you kind of think like, all right, so 1%, and then you need to come down in that 1% and then come down to just 3% of that one whole percent of the entire atmosphere. And it's merely one-tenth of previous historical values. We're at nearly extinction-level event readings on the CO2. You know, you got to realize that 280, nothing grows. No plants, no humans, no fish, no water, nothing works at that point. Feedback loops stop especially with flora and fauna. Everything goes 100% extinct if we go below 280 parts per million. In the past, it's been as high as 7,000 parts per million, and the temperature was only about 3 degrees Celsius warmer than today. Some say 3.7 to 4.2. Okay, right in that area. But you got to realize 7,000 parts per million, how big would the plants have been? That's plant food. We're coming down to literally almost extinction level event CO2 concentrations on the planet, yet the powers that be are saying we need to reduce it back again. That's scary. 400 parts per million is just barely alive for the entire planet's ecosystem in terms of forests and creatures. They don't teach you that in school, though, do you? When's the last time you saw those numbers tossed around by teachers in your classrooms, if you're younger, in school, listening? Now, the beginning, here's the thing. The IPCC thought that there was only a three-year lag between solar activity or solar output changes, decreasing sunspots, increasing sunspots. They thought there was a three-year time lag. And that's the assumption and what all the models were built on was a three-year time lag. Well, sorry. They just have rediscovered and reformulated. And this whole team that was involved in this from ResearchGate, this is absolutely the most important article of the year coming out. It's a 25 year lag. So with that being said, if the high point was 1998 and the decline began in 98, after that high point in 97 to 98, during that El Nino year there, eh, maybe tapered out into a, a sliver of 99, 1999. This 25 year lag on the cooling begins now. Trueleafmarket.com, I really wanna talk about Growing your own food, which will be a necessity moving forward. And there's so many ways that we can go about growing different types of vegetables that we're going to need. You know, microgreens are incredibly nutritious. They're super fast to grow. In less than a week, you can have something that you can eat. Also, sprouts. We can get those a little bit taller, a little more dense, a little bit larger volume on the vegetation mass coming off of there. So how do you know what kind of sprouts to grow? How about wheatgrass or herbs? What about different types of herbs that we can add to our foods? Now, what I just described to you, there's a full range of starter guides there at trueleafmarket.com for you to take a look at. Even if it's just for your own knowledge and you don't purchase something from them, at least get the information so you know how to grow microgreens, you know how to grow sprouts, you understand what some of the herbs are for. TrueLeafMarket.com. Use the link below and give yourself the gift of organic and heirloom seeds. And I, I really try to read through counter arguments. You know, a lot of you who follow my channel on YouTube, Adapt 2030, perhaps you think that I only focus on cold, but I'd really try to weigh in the arguments on the other side as to why they think the way they do about what the CO2 is doing 
So I can start to formulate on if I'm talking about the effects of the sun, how can I have a decent conversation without yelling to try to explain my side of the argument and my side of the story, my side of the research to the uh, to the global warming side. So one of my sites that I really like coming to to find this information on the alternative opinions is called the Big Wobble. Now, they are very pro CO2 warming, and I really appreciate the type of information that they put out. So from their perspective, they're putting out exactly an explanation of how CO2 is warming the planet and what they see as the indicators or the effects of CO2 warming on their mind frame and track of thought, which I think is amazing. Just like if you were to look at my work, you'd say, well, this guy thinks it's all the sun. This is how he's thinking and putting his thoughts together. So anyway, big shout out to the bigwobble.org. I appreciate your work out there for uh, assembling a whole different set of information. Now, here's the thing. 22 days this is a good headline here. 22 days into 2019, catastrophic weather events bringing unprecedented start to extreme year records breaking across the globe. It's only going to amplify from here from 2019. This is the expected year for the biggest amplification over anything we've seen in the last five years. So, again, I'll try to explain it. Everything that you've seen in terms of weather amplification over, let's say, 2015 up until today, everything you've seen or read about, extreme floods and heat and snow and ice and whatever else, volcanoes and all the, we can lump that into one total as just like one unit of change. So in your mind, put that, everything you've ever read about, seen, heard, watched news stories on, that's all just one unit of change. Now, in 2019, we're going to double that amount of change in a single year. And then as we go through 2020, everything that has been doubled in 2019 is going to double again, which is really interesting with the extended seasons. It's going to get really cold all the way through the planting season. The winter's going to onset earlier than last year, which you saw these massive blizzards ripping through all the croplands. They had to abandon billions and billions and billions of dollars in crops out in the fields they couldn't harvest. Insurers are reeling from the losses, asking for government bailouts because the amount from the premiums is not covering the, the payouts any longer. So next year, there's some areas, some states, some provinces that are not even going to have private insurance for crop losses to the farmers. They're going to have to use government programs because private insurance can't cover the losses anymore. So then the next question you might ask is, well, where are the farmers going to get all the loans in the credit system to get the seed, the machines and everything they need? If next year's yield is going to diminish from this year's yield, would you give a loan in an exact place that had three years of crop losses where the insurers are paying out three years in a row on losses that are intensifying? So if it was, you know, 10% loss one year in, say, 2016, then it was 20% in 2017, it was 50% in 2018, you as a bank, would you loan out to those farmers going, hmm, I'm wondering what 2019 will bring in that same exact location? A small example of what's happening in the agriculture industry across the planet. And if you can't get insurance, are you going to plant? Be the farmer for a second. Like, you know, you got wiped out in, in percentage wise for the last three years. Now, you don't have any more crop insurance. Are you going to take the risk and go ahead and use your own money to plant out? The government programs are still the fallback. But in the future, I don't know how long that's going to go for. So anyway, back to the article here, we're talking about the extremes and this is the extremes. Here it is. They have a really good graphic in here. Minimum maximum temperatures. There was 57 degrees Celsius below zero in Russia, but in Australia, it was 48 degrees Celsius above zero. Now, the Russian temperatures are getting cooler and they've been getting cooler for the last couple of years. Even the news stories in Russia just spout about again and again how early the cold was, how intense it was, and then Everything through the year is several degrees cooler than the average is right now, and the storms are blistering like pointy ice storms. It's hard to explain, like needle ice is the best way to describe it. There's been a change in the type of precipitation that's coming down, leading all these weather fronts as well. They call it this needle ice blowing at 60, 70 miles an hour. You can imagine how that would sting if you get whipped by it. Stuck out in a blizzard, 80 mile an hour winds with needle ice. Yeah, sounds like a good day. So the whole thing in the global warming, you know, camp right now is they're completely focused on Australia, completely focused on Australia. 
And the stories abound like, hey, it's 50 degrees Celsius. Oh, my gosh, it's so hot. It's a Australian heat wave, forgotten history. This comes off of Joanne Nova's site. I don't know if you're familiar with Joe Nova, J-O-N-O-V-A. You need to go check out her site. She is down in Australia and very good at pointing out when the Bureau of Meteorology tampers with the data. That is her specialty, finding the data tampering and the way that they adjusted the temperatures in the past to make it cooler in the past to show a trend of more warming. The whole thing is they reduced the temperatures in the past because what they're showing here and what Joe Nova has come up with is like, wait a second, the media is talking about 50 degrees Celsius. It's like all time record heat. But the Bureau of Meteorology stops recording anything done prior to 1910. And then she's asking the question, why did they stop at 1910? Why didn't they go back? Because Australia has records back into the late 1800s. So why did they only use from 1910 forward? And then she lays it out. Well, the Bureau of Meteorology throws it away because it shows in the 1890s, 120 years ago, it was 50 degrees Celsius and 48 and 49 for weeks on end. Even in the shade, because they were talking about how the uh, the boxes at that time without screens, they were non-screened boxes. So that's why the BOM says we can't use it. It was a non-screen box. They were still in the shade under cover and they were reading 50 C. They were actually two to three degrees higher than today's record temperatures that the media is telling you it's the warmest ever recorded in Australia. See, what they do is they go back and they say 160 days in a row above 38 C back in 1924. This is in Marble Bar. This is far out west. But then Joe Nova comes up and says, wait a second. Why don't we look at the 1880s temperatures because they're warmer than today? I'm going to bring you back to, let's go back. Let's take a little trip back in history here. I'm going to take you back to January 18th, 1889. Come back with me in the Wayback Machine. The Ballarat Star, 1889. Genuine heat waves, South Australia, they're looking at about the exact same, 115 degrees Fahrenheit, 121 degrees Fahrenheit, 9 a.m., 120 degrees. And they just have a whole list of numbers at the time and the date, the 15th, 16th, and they have all these different dates around inside there. But 120 degrees is what I'm seeing, 121 degrees, 120 degrees, 115, 116, 121 these are the same exact temperatures that the media is telling you it's the all-time hottest ever in Australia. But here are newspaper clippings and articles from the newspapers back in the day. Heat waves and fevers. And then this is funny on the bottom there. There's an advertisement that says Eureka, special ginger beer. Nice. And then you should ask the question, you know, are the measurements wrong? I mean, are those measurements that were done in, in from 18... 85 forward? Are those wrong up until 1910? Why are they not counted? Why was the arbitrary date at 1910? Because the screens weren't in 1910 either. The screens didn't come until later. So this whole explanation of, well, we can't use it because it wasn't screened at that time. Well, screens didn't come for about another 10 to 15 years after that in the 1920s. So why did they stop in 1910? Oh, the centennial minimum. This is the reason. Now, if you go back in the sunspot count and you take a look at the sunspot cycles, if we go back about 100 years to what, 1910, you'll find an extreme cold low period at that time. Now, how convenient is that to start your mapping of the temperatures to say, look, ever since 1910, it's gotten warmer. But why don't go back to 1880 when it was an extreme heat wave? Because that would have a W bump in it. And that wouldn't be convenient for getting global taxes to show a W compared to a straight up U. You can't have the heat and then dip into the cold and then back the heat. That shows a cycle. But to have just from cold to hot, that counts as we need your global tax money. As you can probably tell, I'm not a fan of global taxes for something that doesn't exist. There's already enough taxes taken out of our wages, our paychecks, things you buy to the point where, you know, having a family that it's a thriving family, it lives in abundance 
you need to be a little ingenious to to come past the the normal workings of the way they've set society up by just taxing everybody to death. This video is brought to you by our friends at TrueLeafMarket.com. Heirloom and organic seeds for any grow zone on our planet. 